welcome each and every one of you, as always, to um, the start of another uh, Wednesday morning Bible study series here at Faith Lutheran. Um, just in case we have somebody joining us on the live stream for the very first time, I'm Pastor Rob Harbin, one of two pastors that serve God's people here at Faith. And Pastor Clayton Sellers, he's on the, um, on the computer, and he'll be rushing in here in just a moment, like he always does, doing his Superman impression. I'm going to have to get you a cape. Please don't. The Incredibles the, taught us that superheroes shouldn't wear that is, capes. That is true. If, if you know The Incredibles, you know that superheroes should not have capes. That's right. Capes are dangerous. Isn't there? I feel like there's a shirt that like not all superheroes wear capes and it's like a mom or something. Like moms don't wear capes and they're superheroes. I agree. Moms are superheroes. Happy ha Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, today we are starting a new series uh, entitled Ancient Heresies, Modern Cults. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is um, spending some time talking about what were the ancient heresies that the first three, four hundred years of the church had to deal with, uh, and what you will discover is that those uh, heresies are still around. Mm -hmm. uh, they have, um, they have uh, crept back into the church in new forms, uh, new iterations that you will recognize, and today um, the study guide probably hints at a little bit of that. Um, at any rate, we should go ahead and get started because we want to make the most of the time that we have and the hour that we have. So, yep. Pastor Clayton, would you mind open us, opening us up with a prayer? Yeah, this one is titled, uh, The Prayer to See God's Ways. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Please show me now your ways that we may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of our own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word, and I will declare your greatness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, just a reminder, because this is a live-streamed Bible class, uh, we ask that uh, you keep your questions and your comments concise and short uh, for the benefit of folks at home. We do know that we have people who follow the live stream from home, um, but they can't hear your voice. So we have to repeat that. And the shorter and concise, uh, the shorter and more concise you make your questions or comments, obviously, the better we can repeat it. Yep. Uh, and if you are at home, uh, both pastors have our smartphones, and uh, we are texters, so uh, sometimes we do get texts, and you're uh, welcome to make comments or ask questions that way as well. And also, um Christine, the office manager, is uh, not in today, and that matters because she usually puts the, the hand up, the worksheet, onto the website for those joining the live stream, um, and she's not in today, and I'm ignorant of how to do that. So All right. you'll have to do without a worksheet if you're... Uh, Basically, what you have to do is go find a blank sheet of paper and just write down everything that you see us talk about, right? Let's take a transcript. So what is a heresy? Let's get started Ooh, with this question. conversation. Pastor Clayton, what is a heresy? What is a heresy? Um, so... I, so uh, the her a heresy is a uh, uh, an opinion or a thought or a belief that is at wide variance with the established orthodoxy. So, okay. So, and I say it that way because you can say something. Um, so maybe um, if you, if you're a, if you're an old Miss fan, it would be heretical to say that Mississippi State is a decent school. Right, it, it would like that's so you can you can apply that term. I, I use that example because we have that's a cultural that's example. It's a cultural example, uh, but we mean it in the religious way that that a heresy is to hold something that is at wide variance within the the Christian church within the Christian faith. So there there is some room, uh, wiggle room, an argumentation about certain parts of Christian doctrine that the scriptures aren't in completely clear on. I'm not, I'm not talking about forgiveness of sins or the incarnation of Jesus Christ as, as God in the flesh, but there are other parts where, where faithful Christians, well-meaning Christians can be at, at variance like with how one old, another. Like how old is the earth? Right, how old is the earth? Um, uh, how old was Jesus uh, when, he, when he began his ministry? You know, these, these, other, these little details where you can kind of go back and forth in a good-natured argument. Um, but a heresy would be something like, Jesus wasn't actually divine. That's a heresy. That's at wide variance. That's at, 
uh, and a disagreeable variance with the established orthodoxy and right knowingness of, uh, of the Christian faith. And why is it important that we recognize and identify the heresies, not just of the ancient church, but of the modern church today? Because it, they, um, they still lead us astray. It, it still matters. We still have to, we still have to be on our toes and, and discerning stuff and, and being uh, um, on, on the news. He used to be on the news. Now he has his own consulting firm, uh, Andy Wise. Uh, he has this little thing on the news here in Memphis where he, he wants you to be a smart consumer, to not just answer any phone call, don't just return any email, don't just give out your credit card information to anybody, but to be a wise and discerning customer and person in the world. Uh, same thing goes in the Christian faith, but even more so. Just because somebody calls themselves a preacher or says that they're a member of the church or says that this is a, a, a Christian denomination, we have to be wise and discerning in, in how we take these things in. And that leads us to that first teaching point, and this is why it's so important. Folks, the most potent lie in the church is one with a kernel of truth. This is why it's so critical that you are able to identify, why, why you need to know what the ancient heresies were, and you need to be, uh, to be able to identify their new iterations in our culture and world today, because they have a kernel of truth embedded in them. And you're going to see that in the, uh, as we get into this, the, the oldest of the heresies of the church, mm -hmm. which is, Pastor Clayton, who no, are they? The Gnostics. The Gnostics. I wrote it, uh, you know. Oh, up down the side. Here. Yeah, I wrote it. Uh, what do you call that? Is that acrostic? It's not really an acrostic. It's not really it's, an acrostic. But I just wrote it top, to, top down top instead down. of left, right. I didn't write it Hebrew, which would be right, left. Correct. <laughs> okay. And what we want to do today is we want to talk a little bit about who were the Gnostics? What did they believe? Because this is the foundation for our conversation. Uh, we're not going to cover every detail of the Gnostics in one hour. You just can't do it. All right. This is not going to be an exhaustive time. We're just going to summarize the key, uh, the key beliefs. And, and the first mm -hmm. interesting belief among the Gnostics was what, Pastor Clayton? Uh, it was dualism. Dualism. What is that? So... Dualism, you, we know dualism, um, do you, you know the sign, the yin-yang symbol? That's, that's a symbol representing dualism. Yes, yeah, so don't get that tattooed onto your flesh. Don't have the yin and the yang tattooed onto your body. Do we have any people here interested in tattoos? Uh, John, you, you like tattoos. Yeah, yeah, John's a tattoo guy over there. Just kidding, just he's got, kidding. He's got an American eagle flying through a flag on his chest. It's pretty <laughs> impressive. No, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, it, 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 this stuff kind of matters. Mm -hmm. um, we should not be tattooing our bodies or wearing mm -hmm. jewelry uh, of symbols that, that are heretical. Yeah, right. Right. Yin and yang, that, that, that's another yeah. one. that You and do so, sometimes see people with a pendant around their neck mm -hmm. of the yin and the yang, and that's dualism. And the basic idea of dualism, uh, at least from a Gnostic perspective, is that the spirit, the soul, is good, and the body, the physical, mm -hmm. is evil. All right? The, the spirit is good, and the physical is evil. And, and this is really, uh, again, kind of a launch point mm -hmm. for the way the Gnostics dealt with their spirituality. Uh, so, for example... Um, true God is spirit only. True God is spirit only. And that means that there's no room for, uh, within the divinity mm -hmm. for any kind of physical, right. um, uh, physical um, uh, Manif essence. Yeah, no, no physical manifestation. No, and, but then it also, guys, this, this stuff is real. We, we have to just say it out here. Gnostic, Gnostic belief is very weird. It just is. And we just have to accept it that, that people followed it back then. People still follow it today. And it's not, it, it's not a co completely coherent way of viewing the world. And so it just gets really weird and really mixed up because they have the divine God, but then they have to, they have to wrestle with the fact that we live in a, in a physical world and a physical reality and so they have these weird twists and turns and ways of viewing the world and saying things that protect the true spirit God from the, 
the physical realm and the, the bad and evil things that happen in the physical realm. And so it just gets a little convoluted, and we're, we're kind of jumping over some of that because it's, it's not worth our effort to get into the ins and outs of how they do it. It's important for us to know that it exists. Still. And the New Testament writers dealt with the first form of Gnostics. They're called the proto-Gnostics, all right? Gnosticism in its, I guess, most um, uh, unpacked form shows up in the second and the third century, okay? The second and the third century after Christ. But already in the first century, there was a proto-Gnostic um, uh, presence mm -hmm. that uh, Paul and John especially had to write against uh, in, in, their, in their epistles. And we're going to look at that. And we're holding off on some of these scripture readings, folks. We're going to get to that a little later on. We just want to, we got we to kind of get all the pieces of the Gnostics out on the table so that we can understand them and discuss them. And it's interesting because if the spirit or the soul is good and the body or the physical is evil, then the goal for the human is to do what? Is to transcend the physical, is to get out of the physical world, to, to no longer be subject to, the, to hunger and pain and cold and, and all those physical sensations and, and having to suffer the suffer in the flesh and in the body, and, uh, and so you want to, to get out of that. So to, to transcend the physical, the physical world is, is what the goal is. And already, if you know your Bible, okay, already you see a fatal flaw in Gnosticism, all right, and in the first form of the, the Gnostics. Mm -hmm. Because how many of you remember uh, what Jesus said, or excuse me, what Jesus mm -hmm. said? No, I mean, well, it's true. Yeah. Okay, what God said at the end of each day of creation. What did God say? You can go back to Genesis chapter 1, and you can read at the end of every day, what did God say when he surveyed his creation? You know this, right? And it's interesting because at the end of chapter 1, in Genesis 1.31, uh, God, God said it was... Very good. Very good. And if I get, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna butcher Don't. the Hebrew. Tov ma'ov. Mm -hmm. In the Hebrew, it says tov ma'ov. It was very good. Uh, so there's this emphasis on the goodness yep. of creation, which you already can see how the Gnostics, okay, and uh, the Scriptures, they, they're going in two different directions. All right. Questions or comments on that basic tenet of of Gnosticism. Moving on, number two. Uh, it now logically follows that if the spirit is good and the physical is evil, then Christ's true humanity had to, it, to be what? Denied. denied. They denied the humanity of Jesus Christ. Uh, this led to one early form of, of Gnosticism called Docetism. Uh, it, it's there on your study guide. Uh, it, was, it was one of the more famous forms of Gnosticism. And Docetism comes from the Greek word dokeo. Mm -hmm. And dokeo means to seem or to appear. And so what they argued was that Jesus only appeared to be human. But he wasn't really human. He appeared like he had human flesh. Right. But he was not um, a physical yeah. being. And not only that, and we'll get on into this next week, they deny the divinity of Jesus. So instead of Jesus being one of the persons of the Godhead, they say that Jesus is a lower God, a, a demiurge is what they call him. So not only is he not, is he not in the flesh, because it, he only seemed to be in the flesh, uh, but he also isn't actually part of the, the Godhead, part of that, what we would call the Trinitarian God, but the, the supreme God over all things. They deny that and they make him to be a a lower form, a lower, lesser, lowercase g God, I guess, is, is how we might think about there it. There you go. Uh, and then number three that we want to cover today, that's, again, kind of foundational, and actually this is really big. Mm -hmm. um, there is no sin in the Gnostic way of thinking except ignorance. <laughs> there is no sin. They don't, they don't talk in terms of, of, uh, of sin. Now, now, this is getting really dangerous. Uh, why is this getting really dangerous if there's no sin? Well, then what do you need to be saved from? Then what do you need to be and saved how from? How do you explain anything And the world? if there's no sin, then that means you can pretty much do what? Anything you want. Whatever you want. And this was a problem with the Gnostics, all right? Uh, so there is no sin except ignorance. And salvation, all right, for the Gnostics 
is not by faith, but by mystic knowledge. Uh, So there is no sin, just ignorance. And salvation is not by faith, but by mystic knowledge. So um, you had to know the secrets. Um, And this is interesting because in the later forms of Gnosticism, and I'm so thankful everyone in this room is still awake and not falling asleep. (laughs) But uh, in the later forms of Gnosticism, when it got really developed, uh, the whole idea was that when you died, your spirit would leave your body and you would travel through the cosmos. And as you passed the, uh, the, the different uh, demiurges mm-hmm. to get to the, the, the supreme being, they asked you code words or passwords. You had to know the passwords to get by to get where you needed to go. So again, this is really, yeah. really interesting. Uh, no sin just ignorance, right. and salvation is not by faith. Faith is not a part of their uh, equation uh, or formula of salvation, but it's mystic knowledge. Right, which leads us to a part that we haven't covered. Gnostic comes from the Greek root word? Gnosis. Gnosis, right? <laughs> so it's, so the, the in, embedded in the title that they, have give, that they gave to themselves and that we still refer to them by points to this idea of knowledge, right? So the Gnostics are the the knowledgers. You have to gain this mystic, this secret knowledge. Um, and if you don't have it, too bad for you. You're out of luck. You're out of luck. But if you do get it, because whatever reason, then you're, you're in. So the title Gnostic points to the ignorance and the knowledge that needs to be revealed. Right. Okay. So those are the three big ones we're going to cover today, the three, the three big tenets. There are others, uh, again, but we're, we... Um, these serve our purposes just just fine. Now, let's get into a more modern conversation. Let's get to something that the church has had to deal with already over the course of the last 10, 20 years. How many of you have ever heard of the Gnostic Gospels? All right, the Gnostic Gospels. I have a copy on my desk in the office. Room. You, have a, you have a copy of the Gnostic Gospels? I do. You, a devotional reading? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't tell you because you don't have the knowledge. Uh, but, Bing! But fun, interestingly, I did check it out from the library. Yeah, uh, sure. I, che- I checked it out from the Carter Library. So there was a controversy that came up not uh, probably within the last 10, 20 years yeah. where they found, okay, you, you heard this on CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, yep. they found the gospel, the lost gospel of Thomas. Okay, y'all remember this? The gospel of Thomas. And there was this big brouhaha over, well, wait a second, how come the gospel of Thomas did not make it into the canon of the New Testament? How come it didn't make it as one of the books of the New Testament? And, and so there was this big, consp- I mean, this is, this is, this right, is, this is Da Vinci Code level this conspiracy. This is Da Vinci Code stuff. How many of you have ever heard of the Da Vinci Code? Read the book or seen how the movie? How many of you have read the book, seen the movie, Tom if you, Hanks? If you haven't, don't. Yeah, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. Um, one of the things about the Da Vinci Code that's, that is um, really, uh, uh, we said the most potent lie is one with a kernel of truth. There's, there's a kernel of truth that Dan Brown embeds into mm-hmm. the Da Vinci Code. But one of the things that Dan Brown does in his book, The Da Vinci Code, is that he changes the historical backdrop. He changes history itself and promulgates this as the, uh, the new, um, uh, the, the, what really happened, mm-hmm. okay? I mean, he's literally, in his book, uh, and in his books, I should say, and in the movies, uh, promulgating a lie, a straight, bold-faced lie about what really happened. And so this big conspiracy surrounds the finding of the Gospel of Thomas and, um, and, and the others. I, uh, we've listed uh, a couple of them there. There's the Gospel of Thomas. There's the Gospel of Philip. Um, what happened in 1945, Pastor Clayton? Anybody? Anybody? The second greatest archaeological... Yeah. It really was. The second yeah. greatest archaeological find in the 20th century yep. happened in 1945. In, e- in Egypt, south of, south of Cairo, um, up, upstream from Cairo, right? Because the, the Nile yeah. River yeah. flows south Close to up. north. Um, and so they were, they were digging for... Uh, what were they? They were digging. They were digging for uh, bird droppings because it, it's in, for phosphates and the nitrates, and it can be a great, great fertilizer. So they're digging. They find under a big rock, and they find this um, 
this earthenware jar that's sealed. And uh, thinking that there, were treasure, there was treasure in it, they broke it open, thinking, ah, we're going to find gold. Uh, they didn't find gold, but they found 52 uh, books, codices is, is what they were referred to, 52 bound codices uh, that contained what we now refer to as the Gnostic Gospels. And this was in uh, 1945 in a place called Nag Hammadi. Uh, you've probably heard of Nag Hammadi. It's in Egypt. It's in the desert. Um, and so then, then it, it hit the news. These, these books eventually made it into the Western world. Um, and those folks who uh, were already of a heretical uh, and blasphemous bent said, we have proof that the church has suppressed the knowledge. We have proof that the Christian church is just a bunch of oppressors and power-hungry people. And here's the proof that they, they, they promulgated this Christian faith that's, that's not true, and they've squashed all these other ones. That's kind of how the, yep, that's that's how how that how the conversation goes. Um, and so, so then now these, these, these quote-unquote gospels, and we, I guess we just use the term because there's no better... Yeah, that, that's just the title. That's they are not Gospels, all right? There are only four Gospels. And what are they? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And they are Gospels in a capital G sense. But the, we should, we should, what, is it, what does Gospel mean? It, mean? it comes from the Greek word euangelion. Yep. Which means to gospelize. No, which means to good news. Come on. I, that's that's that being was, tautological. Uh, it, it means to uh, to share good news. It's it's uh, e, e, we we have an English word, evangelical, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, you can hear the Greek euangelion, evangelical. evangelical. We we actually ha- we basically just went straight from the Greek into the English with mm-hmm. the word. We kept the we kept the Greek in our English mm-hmm. language. Uh, but it means to got to evangelize, yeah. to good news, or to I like gospelize. To gospelize. <laughs> to gospelize. But there are only four gospels, capital G, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm-hmm. These others are loosely called gospels. Uh, they are supposedly um, words of Jesus recorded by Thomas and Philip and some of these other characters. Yeah. Now. The big controversy was, just a few years ago, we found these lost Gospels. We found these lost ancient writings. Uh, The church, as Pastor Clayton um, reminded us, has suppressed all of this. um, And the church are a bunch of power-hungry, misogynistic... um, Patriarchal. Patriarchal. uh, All the pejoratives you can think of. All the pejoratives you can think of. And this is how the church uh, was portrayed... Even in the news media, all right. Of course, Dan Brown he he um, uh, he he saw this he saw this wave and he said, "I'm surfing that that thing." And mm-hmm. he wrote his book and, of course, uh, made his millions. Um, so there was a voice, there was an ancient voice for the Gnostics, all right. And Nag Hammadi was the place where they found a library of 52 of these tracks. Um, and, and, and until we found those. We knew, we knew that the Gnostics had written stuff because we had Christian writings speaking against them. Yeah, so this is, this yeah. is the point that I was yeah. getting at. I'm here to tell you these Gnostic tracts were not new. These were not new mm-hmm. to the church. The church wrote about them already in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. And especially a guy by the name of Irenaeus... Irenaeus condemned them. 340 pages of condemnation of the Gnostic 340 writers. pages uh, in Irenaeus' famous work against heresy, yeah. or heresies. Yeah, creatively uh, titled. Yeah, creatively, against heresies. Uh, uh, Irenaeus condemned these books. So here's the point that I'm trying to make that I want to remind you. When you hear in the news that these ancient texts have been discovered, no, they have not been discovered. The church already knew about them, and the church condemned them, and the church excluded them from the New Testament. All right, uh, why would they? Uh, why why were they excluded? I'm glad y'all asked that question because it's really important for you to, to be reminded why did the New Testament books get included in the New Testament in the first place? Right? Why did that happen? There were three, uh, this is a little excursus here. Trust me, we will get to modern Gnostics in a moment but we gotta, and the we weirdness. Have lay, we have to lay the groundwork. And it's important to note that between the writing of Irenaeus and the discovery at Nag Hammadi, 
there were no living versions of the Gnostic Gospels, right? It's not as if they had carried on. We, didn't, we as a society didn't have them. They didn't exist. They had literally withered on the vine and died, and nobody was, was keeping that tradition alive. Unlike, unlike the New Testament. Unlike the New Testament. Which we have multiple libraries, right, right. Of, of New Testament um, uh, 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 texts, mm-hmm. as well as fragments, right. as well as complete, uh, complete codices. Anyway, so there were three things that got a book into the New Testament. First was, what, what was it, Pastor Clayton? Let's see, where can I write this? I think I can get it right here. So what was the first one? Apostolic witness. Apostolic witness. What did that mean? So the apostles were the source of the writing. So, for, so we have to call it apostolic witness because the Gospel of Luke was written by a guy by the name of Luke who was a physician. He was not a technical one of the twelve apostles of Jesus. However, Luke ran around with a guy by the name of Peter, Simon Peter, who was an apostle of Jesus, and he ran around with a guy by the name of Paul, who was an apostle of Jesus. And he had a relationship with Jesus' mother, Mary. Mary. And he uh, interviewed a bunch of people. And, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but when you, re- when you read the four Gospels, which Gospel has the most Christmas narratives of the four? Luke. Luke. And why would Luke have all of the Christmas, those really great Christmas narratives? Because every mom remembers her birth Because her mom, the, Jesus' mom, delivers this great information to Luke and he writes it all down. Again, divine inspiration, right? By the power of the mm-hmm. Holy Spirit. So, apostolic witness. Uh, Luke being the one, the one um, e- exception, mm-hmm. all the other writers of the New Testament were eyewitnesses of Jesus and his resurrection. You got that? Yep. So all of the uh, New Testament writers were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so if you're a witness, <laughs> you got uh, check, you know, uh, and it, you get check box number one. And, and it matches what the apostles preached, right? So remember... Rem- remember that the apostles... Which leads us to the second right, one, really. The, the, 11, the, the 11 apostles and then... Was it Matthias they voted in? Yeah, Matthias was voted in 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 Acts. Most of those guys leave Jerusalem and go to the ends of the world, you know, up into France and over to India and and all all around that Mediterranean world. And they're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. And then the written gospels are are following close on the heels of what these apostles have been preaching. And the the people reading the Gospels are are what we call the Gospels are reading what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote, and they're going, yeah, this matches with what uh, Matthias was just here preaching. So Matthias, the guy who was an eyewitness and lived it and was there, he just came preaching to us. Oh, look, and this guy Matthew, he wrote stuff down, and it matches. Okay, we're keeping this one. Oh, look, here's this letter called the Gospel of Judas. Well, this doesn't sound anything like what Matthias was just preaching to us. This is really weird. Well, before you go there, also remember that all 27 of the New Testament books were put down on paper, in print, by the end of the first century. In fact, 26 of the 27 New Testament books were put down on paper before A.D. 70. All right. Even liberal scholars now concede this point, that all of the New Testament books were written in, within a generation of Jesus ascending into heaven. I hope, you, I hope you get what I'm saying. Eyewitness, apostolic witness. The Gnostic Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, these actually show up in the 2nd and the 3rd centuries. They show up over 150 years after uh, the apostolic witness of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Y'all, y'all, y'all get that, right? And so the church, they recognize, wait a second, you know, this stuff is just now showing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's got Thomas's name attached to it. But we know Thomas went to India. Uh, and Thomas died back in, what, A.D. something or other yeah. when he was martyred. All right? So if Thomas died and now this thing is showing up 150 years later, something doesn't add up. And so Irenaeus, this is what he writes. There's a quote there on your study guide. The, they produced, the, the Gnostics, uh, the Gnostic writers, 
they produce a fictitious history of this kind which they label the Gospel of Judas. Uh, in particular, he's, he's addressing one of the other um, uh, Gnostic Gospels. Uh, so we knew, Irenaeus knew about these, and they were condemned. Mm -hmm. uh, the second ingredient that got a book in the New Testament was what, Pastor Clayton? Uniform doctrine. Uniform doctrine. In particular... Christocentric. It's centered around Christ's incarnation, His crucifixion, His resurrection, His promised return, and the forgiveness of sins that He won through His perfect sacrifice on the cross. All right. Now, this is where, this is where things get a little weird. <laughs> I actually have a quote for you from the Gospel of Thomas. Got it. Tr tractate 22. And this is a Gnostic gospel, okay? So this is something that was written 2nd, 3rd century. The church excluded it from the New Testament. Remember, we told you earlier that salvation is about um, not by faith, but it's by knowledge, secret knowledge, all right? And that the problem is not sin, it's ignorance. Well, this is what Jesus says uh, about uh, uh, okay. in the gospel of Thomas. This is, what, this is what he is purported to have said um, Concerning salvation, when, when people will, will be um, saved. Mm -hmm. You'll love this. When you make the two one, and when you make the inside like the outside, and the outside like the inside, and the above like the below, and the below like the above, and when you make the male like the female, and the female like the male, then you will enter the kingdom. How do you like that? Does that sound like gobbledygook to you, yes or no? That's gobbledygook. And so, it, it's, it's this Gnostic gobbledygook, and it's why the church said, no way, Jesus never said that. that this is fake stuff. Uh, fake news? Fake, ooh, well, we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> this is fake news. We'll get there. Uh, and so, uh, they excluded it, and, and, and quite rightly so. And that's why the go these Gnostic Gospels don't make it into the New Testament. And then the... Um, because our time is moving on. Mm -hmm. uh, number three, general use. So there was just a general use of all of the books throughout the ancient church. But we won't go into detail on that one. We'll come back to it maybe another time. All right. So that covers, that's the first half of the class. That covers what we're talking about, these Gnostics. Questions or comments? And you are welcome to do, to. to and if it doesn't make sense, that's fine. <laughs> it's not necessarily supposed to make sense. John, you have a question. Uh, so the question is, anything about the Apocrypha that enters in? Uh, yes, there, there, I, I don't want to go too far down this path, but it's important to note that there are two bodies of writings that are called the Apocrypha in the ancient world. You probably recognize the Apocrypha, capital A, as the intertestamental books that the Roman Catholic denomination still has in their Bible, right? Now, how many of you have ever heard of the Apocrypha, capital A, the middle books? Yeah. Roman Catholics still hold this to we be have scripture. A, we have a Lutheran version of them too, printed separately. Yeah, but, yeah. It, but they're, not, they're not canonical for Lutherans like they are for Roman Catholics. Okay, they still hold the Apocrypha. We do not, all right? And no one else does. But there is an Apocrypha, little a, and um, this is basically the Gnostic writings. It, it's just the, the, uh, the Gnostic writings were known as, or some of them were known as the Apocrypha, uh, apocryphal writings. So we are talking about apocryphal writings. So yes, you are correct. Uh, little a, the apocryphal writings, Thomas, Philip, Judas, they're all wrapped up in that. Right? Sometimes they're also called the pseudepigrapha. All right. Falsely written. Falsely written. All right. Pseuda, pseudo, fake, pigrapha, writing, false writings. Because uh, you put, you put Thomas's name, yeah, Thomas name on it. Yeah, you put Thomas' name on it. What happened to Thomas before the first century? I already said this. He's dead. <laughs> what happened to Philip before the first century was out? Dead. Dead. What happened to Judas? <laughs> dead. He killed himself. We actually have his... We have his death certificate in the Gospels, right? Because Judas, hang, Judas hanged himself. So how can Judas be writing a Gospel in the 2nd and 3rd century when he's dead? You see how this works? So the, the early church, they, you know, these are false writings. They're pseudepigrapha. They excluded them. 
Uh, so good, it's good stuff. It's really good stuff to know. Uh, but the church, uh, the church um, leaders, uh, two th- near, nearly two thousand years ago, they weren't stupid. <laughs> they were they were very smart and they were very tuned in to what mattered. Other questions or comments? So uh, what are you going to add? I was gonna say so. This all sounds like gobbledygook, and we're now. 2,000 years later from all this went down. We, and nobody would, nobody, nobody would, would fall for Nobody's going to fall for gobbledygook smart, anymore. We're too educated. We're too well-knowing. Um, we might like, dis, you know, people might decide to reject the gospel, but surely, surely, Pastor Rob, this sort of secret knowledge and uh, this sort of stuff has just withered away and we're just spinning our wheels looking at historical Unfortunately, stuff. there is a teaching point that the Bible has made very clear to us in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. There is nothing new under the sun. sun. There is nothing new. There is nothing new <laughs> under the sun. <laughs> Unless you're a fan of CBS. <laughs> you had to get that I, I, had, I had to get that one in. How many... <laughs> Sorry, how many of y'all listen to the, to the CBS commercials on, on radio? And, and uh, if you listen to the CBS station, they, they, they have a little tagline, there's always something new under the sun. <laughs> it's just like, shut up. <laughs> no, there isn't. <laughs> there is nothing new under the sun. CBS, you're a bunch of, uh, anyway. So there is nothing new under the sun. Scripture is very clear about this. And so the Gnostics have shown back up uh, and Pastor Clayton, who, who is the, uh, the most recognized, what is the re- most recognized form of Gnosticism yeah. today? So Scientology. Scientology fits under as the most uh, well-known, clearly defined, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it this way, institutional form of Gnosticism. It's the most organized. It, it has an organization. It has a structure. It's got, it's got a can I call it a, the, a I'm going to call it a philosophy instead of a theology. It's got a philosophy. It has, um, it, it has its own liturgy and its own ways of doing things. And so it stands as an institution, as an organization that, uh, I guess promulgate is the word of the day. It promulgates uh, Gnostic beliefs. It doesn't call it Gnostic. They don't call themselves Gnostic. They call themselves the Church of Scientology. And in English, if you add that word church, people automatically think, oh, Christian church. Ah, so the Scientology is just another version of the Christian Christian faith. This is a good point. Anytime somebody attaches church to a title, what do what do unbelievers think about that? It's got to be Christian. It's got to be Christian. It's got to be attached to Jesus, right? Again, let's go back to that first teaching point. The most potent lie in the church a is a truth. lie with a kernel of truth. And when you embed church into your uh, into your name, your title, your institutional tag, whatever uh, label, then you are promulgating yeah. <laughs> uh, a lie because you're you're embedding a kernel of truth, right? Uh, so, who was the founder? You've probably heard of this guy. The founder was L. Ron Hubbard. Okay, he showed up in the 20th century. Uh, this is kind of one of those American-made religions. Uh, he was an author. Yep, he was an author. He wrote. Uh, science, science fiction, fiction sort of space stuff, right? stories. All right. Uh, the, the, there you go. Okay. <laughs> it's a, I see some heads going, nodding out there. Oh, that's why. Uh, there's a, he had a quote. Um, where'd you find this quote, Pastor Clayton? Uh, this was, so the LCMS had a, has a put together like a two-page document talking about Scientology. LCMS being? LCMS, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, the church body that we belong to, um, they put together like a two-page sheet running through, highlighting and trying to condense Scientology into di- digestible bites. And so they found this, uh, I think, in one of his right, in one of his one of the the scriptural books of Scientology. He says this in there. All right, you are an immortal spiritual being. Okay, so what do you already notice there in that statement by L. Ron Hubbard? Spiritual, right? Right. The emphasis is on the spiritual. You are an immortal spiritual being. You are called a thetan. Okay, so now we have a completely made up term. What does that come from? So the Greek, supposedly, apparently, I haven't looked into this, so I'm taking it on second hand, so take it for what it's worth. Apparently, the Greek letter theta stood for, is like symbolic of uh, like the spiritual, the unseen, the immaterial parts of the world. And so 
So he took that symbology or that ancient representation um, and made it to be the descriptor. And don't the Thetans come up in like Marvel comics? And stuff? I don't know enough uh, okay. about, all right, all right. I don't know never, enough never about Marvel comics. Anyway, uh, so you are called a Thetan. The Thetan is the spiritual being himself. It is the individual. It is you. So already there's a couple things you're going to notice here. The emphasis on spiritual over and against the physical and the gobbledygook nature, okay, the gobbledygook nature of, what do we read, you know, in the Gospel mm-hmm. of Thomas, Tract 8, 22, I read it to you, you know, when the male becomes female, and the female becomes male, and when up becomes down, and down becomes up, then you'll enter the kingdom. I mean, this is bizarre stuff, right? It just, it's made up stuff. Uh, somebody just made it up. <laughs> they were, they were, they were smoking some crack. Apparently. I don't know. They were doing something illegal. They were on some kind of illicit substance when they came up with this theology or, or philosophy, right. as Pastor Clayton says. All right, so here are the basics. Uh, and this is, this is weird stuff, I know, but I think you'll, you'll see what we're talking about uh, as, as they're connected with ancient Gnosticism. So every one of us has a reactive mind, mm-hmm. and every one of us has an analytical mind. Okay? Now, what do we say about dual? Uh, y'all remember dualism? What do we say about dualism? Come on, you, this was just 30 minutes ago. Y'all can do this. Dualism. Spirit is good. Physical is evil, right? So they, they, they're, they're, they, they counter one another. They go against each other. You got to escape one to get to salvation, right? Okay, so it's the same stuff. Your reactive mind is bad, okay? And your reactive mind produces these engrams. Yep. And the engrams basically quell your potential. You cannot be who you really need to be unless you get these engrams out of your life. All right? Now, sin? Any sin mentioned here? Nope. No sin. It's ignorance, just like the ancient Gnostics. This is Gnosticism today, folks. (laughs) You got to see this. Um, And so you got to get these engrams out. You, you can't be all you who you can be. Uh, even if you eat Wheaties every day. Right, or join the army. Or join the army. You've got to get the engrams out. So the analytical mind is the good. And it, shuts, it, it gets shut down by the engrams. So how do you get the engrams out? Well, you've got to go to an auditor. Mm-hmm. Somebody who listens. Auditor, audit, auditory, yeah. audit. The auditor listens. They're like, a, uh, I guess, a, a guru. Mm-hmm. They are the... They are the gurus of the, the, Scienta- of, the, uh, of the Church of Scientology. Church mm-hmm. of Scientology. Uh, and the, the goal is to escape uh, the pre-clear state, which has got all these engrams in it, mm-hmm. so that you can get to a clear state. All right? And that is, again, salvation. Faith, is faith part of this conversation? No, it's about getting out of ignorance, having the special knowledge, the auditor helps you get to where you need to be. All right, that's the basics of um, of uh, Scientology. There's more to it, but you can see the connections and the parallels to yep. Gnosticism. Yeah, I think. I mean, w- would you add anything else? Not to Scientology. Uh, we, we know we know of some very famous Scientologists in America today. Half of Hollywood, right? Half of Hollywood, right? It is very. Uh, it's a very. Uh, it's a. It's a very elite group of people. It is a very wealthy group of people. It's probably the wealthiest church in America, um, right? It's probably alongside the the Mormon, mm-hmm. the Mormon church, uh, church, <laughs> yeah. uh, but very wealthy, very powerful. Um, so they they have a lot of influence in Hollywood. There have been some noted individuals who've left Scientology. Uh, what's that lady's name? Leah Ramini. Leah Ramini. How many of you oh, ever Ramini? heard of her? I forget how she says it. Is it Ramini? I don't know. But she's from... Ramini? A, uh, King of Queens. Yeah, she's from King of Queens. If you remember the, the show King of Queens, she was in the Church of Scientology. She left that church because she came to the... The, the, um, the truth. The truth yeah. <laughs> that this is a lie. It's just... Yeah. It, it's, a, it, it's a falsehood. It's a cult. Yep. Uh, and I think, too, we can... As looking ahead a little bit in our conversation, you can see some of the the self help aspects of Scientology, which is you just need to get rid of the bad feelings and let the good feelings flow up, and your life will be more successful. 
You need to see the world in the right way and, and release those evil things that are quelling your potential and, and let the, the good energy flow out of your life. And so, so it's institutionalized in Scientology. And well, there's a couple other places that it gets institutionalized. But you can see the, the, broader, the, the broader Gnostic moves that still exist throughout, the, throughout our lives, throughout the culture um, that, that lead towards this right. dualism sort of stuff. And we have to keep moving just because we, we, we have to uh, go. we got to get to some Scripture before you leave. It's Bible study after all. Yeah. Um, uh, right? Am I right? Mm-hmm. So uh, the, the other thing to note is that the church, of, the church of Scientology does include Jesus in their conversations. Okay? Most potent lies, one with the kernel of truth. You're not saved by faith in Jesus but Jesus is an example mm-hmm. of somebody who left behind the pre-clear state and got to the clear state. He's an, he's, Jesus is not gift. Jesus is example in the church of Scientology. Uh, another, illust- uh, another cult today, and we're not going to unpack this one today as much as we will uh, in the next in the next few classes, if you're if you're if you're uh, if you fall into one heresy, you probably fall into several others as well. And number two would be would Mormonism, the Mormonism. Mormon Church. Uh, you've heard of the you've heard of the phrase. If you rise up through the the hierarchy of the Mormon Church, you become a Temple Mormon, and that's where you the secret things, things that are not commonly known, are revealed to you. You are sworn to secrecy. In, when you get to Temple Mormonism, okay? So this is weird. This is weird. The whole secret thing. This goes back to the ancient Gnostics uh, not being saved by faith, but being saved by knowledge. And it's a mystical secret knowledge. Mm-hmm. Not everybody knows it. You know, it's almost, as if they, it's almost as if they don't want everybody to know it, which is kind of weird. Uh, but it, it is a power thing. Uh, it's a cult thing. Mm-hmm. So there's this secrecy about Mormonism. Another one, number three. So the, the lodges, they don't have as much cultural cachet as they did maybe 20 or 30 year, even 20 or 30 years ago. But the Masonic lodges, the Elks, the, the Grand Poobahs, um, the, the Water Buffaloes, that one that Fred Flintstone was a part of. Um, <laughs> um, I don't remember that. But you know what I'm talking I about, I do, right? yeah. It was the Buffalo they hat. Had the buffalo yeah, they had the hat. Buffalo Maybe it was hat. the Buffaloes. Anyway. Anyway, I'm making I'm making sort of a joke, but because um, because lodges had cachet back when Flintstones was a thing. Happy, um, I remember Happy Days and and uh, oh yeah, he was he was he was uh, a Grand Poobah. Yeah, uh, what's his maybe, name? Maybe I'm blending all these together. Maybe, maybe either way, but they're they're built on uh, once you get into them and start to rise through the ranks um, and you become a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Mason, you have risen through the ranks and you have a secret sort of knowledge that that has been revealed to you and you you're brought into the rituals and and so it's um it's still there this these aspects of the secret knowledge are still parts of these things but we're even seeing gnosticism creep in culturally yeah yeah this is an interesting conversation that uh um that we need to be reminded of mm-hmm. it's it, it's dangerous not just in within within churches but within culture yeah um, we, what do we call it cultural wokeism maybe wokeism. Or um, the, I've been I've been thinking about it a, a lot, especially in light of our conversation. Um, but you have to have the right knowledge to follow the science. If you follow the science, if you follow the science, or if you have the right knowledge to be able to ignore the science, then you then you're good, right? I mean, do you, I mean, just think about how the, the the cultural conversation our society has been in over the last ten years. And how you have to, um, you can only rise up in the culture. You can only escape things from the culture if you recognize uh, your inherent status in society. Or if you can recognize your inherent position as perpetual victim. And then when you, when you recognize that, then you gain, you've got that Gnostic knowledge. And then you're, you're free to, to go on and move on. Uh, so it... It gets and, and anybody who doesn't buy into wokeism is considered ignorant. Ignorant. You see how this works? Even in our culture, it's embedded in our culture today where this secret knowledge, the, the woke have it, and the ignorant like us who aren't woke, well, we're at, 
tough luck. Mm -hmm. You're 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 on your own. Yeah. Uh, so it's a weird, scary kind of thing that we even see creeping into our culture. So we got to wrap this up. We have ten minutes. Uh, I want to be very clear with you, and maybe I should have switched these two around. In fact, let me do that right now. Uh, the bottom the bottom teaching point, folks. Jesus came to reveal, not to conceal. Jesus came to reveal and not conceal. There is nothing secret anymore about our salvation. <laughs> all right? So, uh, any, and, and you will notice that of this of all the cults, all of the cults will suppress, um, they will suppress uh, kind of a, a public, mm -hmm. um, this, you know, uh, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll, su they'll suppress the truth and you have to wait till you get in before yeah. they reveal it. Right. But I was just reading with the kids this morning in Luke chapter 10. Jesus sends the 72 out to proclaim. And then he's in a bunch of Samaritan villages and he sends people ahead of him to say, hey, Jesus is coming. And Jesus comes and he proclaims the gospel of the kingdom of God. Right. So it's it's never it's never a secret. Uh, and then you get the Great Commission, uh, mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching, teaching. revealing, <laughs> making known, teaching them to obey, or in the ESV it says, observe all the things I have commanded you, and behold, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So, uh, and, 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 and what is the book of Acts filled with? What do Paul and Peter, and John, and Philip, and all these characters in the book of Acts do. Do they, do they go around saying, hey, I got a secret. Right. Is that what they do? What do they do? They proclaim they it from pro the rooftops. They proclaim it from the rooftops, right? They want the whole world to know. There are no more secrets. Jesus came to reveal, not to conceal. And if you doubt me, look at Ephesians chapter 3. Verses 1 through 13. I think you've got that one pulled up. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Right. So he's, he's writing of the mystery and making it known. Uh, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has been now been revealed to this holy apostle and prophets by the Spirit. This, the, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gifts of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now, might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for, which, for, for you, which is your glory. All right. So Paul, in his epistle to the Ephesians, says it's a mystery that's being made known. All right. It's something we proclaim. Now, this is interesting because, Pastor Clayton, did you know that the first Gnostics, the proto-Gnostics, had a, a, a very, very strong Jewish synagogue connection? Yeah. So what was happening, right, was that, the first Christians were who? Jewish. Who were the first Christians? They were Jewish in descent. Jews, right? Peter, James, John, all those. Yeah. They're all Jews. Jesus. All right? So we, uh, we are not anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the church started with Jews who, became, uh, who came to faith in the Messiah, the Mashiach, uh, Jesus, the Christ. So, uh, but what happened was some of those Jews in the first century were losing their power and influence. And so in order to keep it, they kind of squashed uh, reaching out to the Gentiles and they made, they made it more difficult for the Gentiles to get into the church. And this is, this is actually where some of the, 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 uh, the first Gnostics came from. But here's the other thing, the other teaching point. The Son of God came to redeem both what? Body. Body. 
and, and soul. soul. Oh, I'm going to have to put an arrow. Body and soul. He came to redeem body and soul. And this really cuts at the this cuts to the heart of the Gnostic way of thinking. Let's go back one more time to dualism. Dualism said what? Here's your quiz again. Spirit is good. Body is evil, right? The physical is evil. Well, did Jesus come just to save your soul? No. You see, this, this is, it, again, it just cuts to the heart. Uh, it tears Gnosticism apart. And this is what we have a threefold witness that we want to share with you. Um, the first witness is the source himself, Jesus Christ. So we're going to quickly look at a few passages, all right? Because I want to pound this in before you leave. Uh, John chapter 20, 26, and 27. Who's, uh, Pastor Clayton, you got yep. that one. Eight days later, his, this is in the upper room. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. All right. So, how did Jesus rise from the dead? Physically. Physically. Bodily, materially. Bodily. Materially, I'm echoing this guy over here. Oh, part of the wokeism, sometimes part of the wokeism of today is to deny the spirit. We were talking about the Gnostics who deny the body. There's a part of, of, of the cultural current that has a, a certain Gnosticism that denies the spiritual side of things and says you just have to realize that you're only material, that only the material universe is what matters. Um, so that's, that's the flip side of the dualism. Yeah, there, there is another form of Gnosticism We've, we've focused on the one, um, the one side. But yes, you, you can have the complete opposite where, uh, again, if there's no sin, yeah. if there's no sin. Dar Darwin. Darwin is a, a materialist. Darwin yeah. is the one who says it's only the material world and that's all that matters. Yeah. So uh, go ahead and eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die, right? It's the Epicurean way of thinking. This is an ancient Greek uh, philosophy. The Epicurean said, hey, you know what? Eat, drink, be merry because to, you know, tomorrow you die. And this fits nicely within Gnosticism because there is no sin. They're not dealing with sin. And so this is dangerous stuff uh, because then you can do whatever you want. Uh, and it doesn't... Whatever, whatever you have the power to do and to, to exert your power over anybody, you can do whatever you want. Now, John who was present in that upper room when Jesus physically appeared to them, has a few things to say. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. What does he, what does he say right from the get-go? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands. Oh, this is great stuff. So John, John is countering these, these proto-Gnostics. You know, because they're saying they're denying they're denying the humanity of Jesus, right? John says, "No, hey, hey, we heard, we saw him, we heard him. Oh, and we we touched this guy. We he was real." Uh, and, and so this is really important to um, to John. Look what he says in chapter four, verse one of that same epistle. Uh, this is um, uh, probably the heart. Th this is literally, if you want to memorize a text uh, in First John. This is the heart of his epistle, his first epistle. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. All right, and one more. Uh, same epistle, chapter 5, verse 6. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. Oh, wait a second. Uh, what has blood in it? Body. 
a body, <laughs> water and blood. Not by water only, but water and blood. So again, in three texts there, John pounds the physical mm -hmm. nature of Jesus, not just as he came into the world, folks, but as he was raised from the grave. And we have time for one more Bible passage and perhaps a question or two. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Paul himself was dealing with these proto-Gnostics. Uh, when I say proto-Gnostic, remember, I'm talking about the first form of Gnosticism. This is one of, this is one of my favorite passages. Yeah, this is a great text. Uh, he, that is Christ, he is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in, him, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. We're going to come back to this text next week, all right? We're going to come back to Colossians 1, 15 through 17. It is jam-packed with a heavy dose mm -hmm. of the supremacy of Christ. And you see intimately, ra uh, in intimately um, connected in this text is the creation and the creator. Uh, one of the things about Gnosticism that we didn't talk about today was how if God is spirit mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and he has nothing to do with creation... God didn't create the universe. He actually, well, it, he hired out. He didn't even hire. It, it's a weird thing. It's weird. He, he subcontracted. Sort of, yeah. I, I'm going to use that term. So God can't be a part of creation. He subcontracts to a, a lesser eon who makes the universe. And that's why the universe is so flawed, right? Because that's why you've got to get out of the physical and get to the spiritual. Because the spiritual God didn't create it. Paul says, no way in Colossians. He says, Jesus is the creator. He is the, uh, his supremacy is second to none. And so um, in, instead of denying not only the humanity of Jesus, Paul or John raises up the humanity of Jesus. And instead of lowering the divinity of Jesus, Paul elevates it mm -hmm. uh, and says Jesus is supreme. So yep. I hope this was helpful for you. Church of Scientology, modern day Gnostics, uh, there are some other ones peppered in there, which we didn't get into. But um, if, you, um, uh, if you have any complaints about this class, please email Pastor Clayton at... Pastor Clayton at faithcollierville.com. At faithcollierville.com. Don't tell me that you didn't like the class. Yeah. Just tell him. Yeah. And, uh, uh, put in the subject line, uh, complaint for immediate addressing. Uh, yes, uh, something along, something those, along lines. those lines. Uh, that but, way I can just but, hit delete real quick. Uh, we... we uh, <laughs> uh, we've permanently banned John from giving feedback anymore. Yeah. He can't. He's, uh, he, right. he's always uh, slamming us and hammering us down. Anyway, uh, any last second questions or comments, seriously, about uh, something that we didn't cover or that we did cover that you just going once, going twice? All right. As you leave today, uh, take the blessing of the Lord with you. St. Paul's uh, closing blessing from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.